Previously on Tim's Book Quest. Where am I? Oh no, been transported. The city of the Dark Elves. My bookshelf, it, it got transported too. Oh, it's just you guys. I've been trapped underground for weeks now. Hiding from Dark Elves, eating moss and cave worms. But I think I finally found a tunnel out of here. I'm worried I might run into dwarves on the way though. So I better do some research, brush up my dwarven etiquette. The Dwarves by Marcus Heights. All right, let me light a torch here. There we go. All right, so The Dwarves, published in 2009, was written by German author Marcus Heights and translated to English by Sally Ann Spencer. It's the first book of a series called, wait for it, The Dwarves, which as of now consists of uh, five books just five? That means that reading the entire series is actually something I could maybe one day accomplish without dedicating multiple years of my one finite life to it. You hear that, Drizzt and Dragonlance, you mother Now obviously where I am now in the realm of magic and fantasy, this book is a historical document about events that actually happened, but just for simplicity's sake I'll be discussing it as if it's fiction, where it might be in the world where you come from. But it turns out this is actually a fitting book to read for my research-centric purposes, as the book is in fact about a dwarf raised by humans who is himself just learning about the ways of the dwarves for the first time. The protagonist dwarf in question is Tungdil Bolifar, later renamed Tungdil Goldhand after an incident with some molten gold, who lives in the human realm of Ionandar, working as a blacksmith for the wizard Lot Ionan, who is himself part of a ruling council of wizards who watches over the greater continent of Girdelgard. Tungdil ends up leaving his quiet hometown on an errand that initially appears to be a simple matter of delivering a message, but which brings him into contact with his fellow dwarves and eventually escalates into a far greater and graver mission. Obviously. I doubt that he gotten 700 pages out of him making a fantasy mail delivery. Now, if I have a criticism as far as the setting of Girdleguard goes, it's that it's all pretty stock fantasy. In fact, in terms of world building and lore, I'd go so far as to say that the dwarves is probably the most high fantasy 101 book I've read lately, which seeing as I read the entire Dragonlance trilogy last year, I don't say lightly. Everything that isn't Dungeons and Dragons with the serial numbers filed off is Tolkien with the serial numbers filed off. This goes for setting and story. Girdleguard is, uh, and go ahead and recite this with me, even if you've never read the dwarves before, if you've read high fantasy at all before, you'll do just fine. It's a loose alliance of kingdoms ruled by men, elves, and dwarves. The dwarves live in mountains and great halls, they're gruff and bearded, they work as blacksmiths, and they use axes. They have a long-standing rivalry with the elves, who are graceful and fair and live in the forest and use bows and arrows. Then there's humans, who live anywhere they want, have whatever kind of job they want, whatever kind of temperament they want, and use whatever kind of weapon they want. Hell yeah, humans rule. Ain't gonna pigeonhole me. What do I look like, some kind of freaking elf? But of course there's a growing threat to Girdleguard in the form of armies of orcs and ogres and dark elves, here called Alfar, or just Alf when singular, who are marching in from, say it with me, the north. Sacking cities and destroying kingdoms in the name of the so-called perished land they hail from. Their leader, a dark wizard named Nadan, uh, is formerly of the same order of goodly wizards that Lot Ionan was part of before he fell to darkness. Don't call Nadan a Saruman ripoff, though. You see... Nadon is fat. Our heroes end up forming a fellowship on a quest to attain a magical axe called Keenfire, said to be the only thing that can hurt Nadon. Uh, among them are dwarves, of course, men, uh, an armor-clad giant, we have fighters, scholars, and there's even a wizard. Don't call her a Gandalf ripoff, though, because you see, Andakai is a chick. Now, okay, okay, I'm obviously poking fun a bit. Even unironic fans of generic fantasy like myself have to poke fun from time to time, but uh, don't take this as a negative review at all, because there is actually a lot to enjoy here, and I'd say it starts with Tungdil himself, who's an interesting and different sort of dwarf, uh, not just the straight Gimli or Flint Fireforge ripoff you might expect. As a dwarf raised by humans, Marcus Heitz does a good job writing him as a confusing swirl of uh, customs and cultures in his heart and his head. Uh, he instantly latches onto and likes uh, many of the dwarven ways he's introduced to, but there's always a bit of human inside of him. That's what she said! And his uh, tastes and language and habits, and the fact that he's more of a scholar than a true dwarven fighter. As a side note, I don't really think this is Tungdil on the cover. He's described as having kind of softer, less warrior's features, and not a particularly huge beard by dwarven standards. 
There are other dwarves in Tungdil's fellowship it could be, though, most notably Boendal and Boindil, who are more traditional axe-swinging, orc-slaying bruisers, especially Boindil, and the warrior-scholar contrast between them and Tungdil is often amusing. I will admit, though, that there's a lot of other dwarven characters, uh, particularly when you go to this dwarven kingdom, and they did kind of blur together a little bit for me. One human character in the Fellowship I'll call out in particular is a playwright and actor turned adventurer named Rodario, and I could totally see how this character could be really annoying in a film adaptation. He's sort of a foppish dandy who's always uh, trying to stay out of the action, wave the warriors ahead when uh, any real conflict arises, and whose dialogue consists about 50% of talking about how excited he is to write the currently happening events of the story and the uh, play he's working on. But he's just, he's one of the few characters who has no real analog in, you know, the, the Fellowship of the Ring or the Dragonlands Companions or anything like that. So in that way, I found him amusing and likable and different. And I'm one who appreciates and is always on the lookout for good villains in fantasy literature. And in that respect, I think I gotta say that Nodon delivers. He's a rock-solid antagonist. His role in the plot is obviously just kind of a mix of Sauron and Saruman, but he's actually a lot more hands-on than either. There's what I like to call Star Wars villain rules, or I could also say JRPG or Dragon Ball Z villain rules, where the top leader of the bad guys isn't just their military commander or head of state, but is also literally the most powerful among them, and the dwarves follows that rule to the letter. Pretty much any time we see Nadana uh, in person, he's just nuts, man. Uh, throwing magical lightning bolts, as you do. But there's also a scene where an entire good guy army attacks him and the little city he's taken over. And instead of even having to send out his army to attack, he just uses his magical psychic powers to break the wall surrounding the city up into a bunch of like one ton chunks that he lifts up. Then he starts flicking them at the good guy army one at a time, killing thousands of soldiers before they even really make an attempt on him. Then on top of that, he uses his magic to raise the uh, now dead soldiers uh, as undead warriors that now obey him among the few living ones to finish the slaughter. That's before he's even sent his orcs and ogres and whatnot out. Uh, other goodly wizards attack him, just turns them to ice, no thing, no problem. Yet the good guys need keen fire to uh, kill him because he is literally all by himself as dangerous as uh, millions of orcs. Now speaking of battles, I'll say that this is definitely a book with action on its mind. Uh, it amps up slowly for the first hundred pages or so, as you do in fantasy books. But once the action starts, it never again for its duration goes more than a few dozen pages without having some manner of small-scale fight, big-scale battle, or chase. There's nothing revelatory in that sense, although one way the book does break cliché is that it never tries to pretend that its actual protagonist is any kind of top-tier fighter. Tungdil's physical arc in this book is basically one of him going from being terrified to fight a single orc to being reasonably confident and competent with the axe, and that's about it. The armor-clad giant Jaren, who's part of the group, easily outclasses Boindil and Boendal as fighters, who in turn outclass Tungdil. From Driz Duerden to Kaladin from the Stormlight Archives to Logan Nine Fingers from the First Law, it's often the thing in fantasy that the protagonist is by default among the very best fighters in their universe, so I say the dwarf is actually refreshing in that regard. I'll also give credit to a couple other ways the book breaks cliché. There's a kingly secession subplot running through the entire story that I fully expected the whole time to conclude with your basic Aragorn is crowned King of Gondor type scene, but which zags right where I expected it to zig, right at the end, which I really appreciated. And the book doesn't portray all dwarves as strictly goodly in the Dungeons and Dragons sense either. Okay, okay, almost all of them. But uh, there's one dwarf character, Bislipper, who's actively genocidal desire for a war between dwarves and elves leads him down an eventual path of backstabbing and treachery and murder, which I appreciated, if only for the slight unconventionality of it. One way the book doesn't challenge or break cliché whatsoever is in its depiction of orcs as the most useless and common cannon fodder imaginable. It actually pretends for a quick minute really early on that these are bigger and stronger than Tolkien orcs, but a uh, no. <laughs> no. Uh, characters are just boasting as they wade confidently into battle that uh, the first 20 orc kills are for, you know, insert whatever vengeful cause they have. Uh, the text is just describing the uh, group as cutting through hundreds of orcs with the indifferent and casual ease as if they're playing Hyrule Warriors or something. It would become actively laughable were it not for the encounters with the Dark Elves or the Alfar playing more like boss fights. 
one all seems to be about equivalent in danger to our heroes as, I don't know, a thousand orcs from the way the book depicts it. And there are a few Alfar who get a multiple encounters with the heroes and names and personalities and everything. I'm not bothered or anything by this. It's one way to depict orcs. I am bothered by the indifference with which the book starts to treat the permanence of death. This is the fantasy cliche I've ragged on for decades, literally decades, going back to when I was in junior high school. But I don't like it when fantasy books or sci-fi books or what have you uh, treat lightly the permanence of death, and the dwarves is at least somewhat guilty. You see, people killed by the Parish Land are often revived by Nadon as zombies, but then there's this twist later on where it turns out that uh, zombies with enough willpower can actually resist the influence of Nadon and continue fighting for the good guys. Uh, talking, same personality, everything. Uh, the book pays lip service to the idea that it sucks to be a zombie, but still, you, you can't get around the fact that it robs death of its impact. So overall, not a book absent flaws by any means, but uh, overall I'd say I enjoyed it. If the idea of a journey through a very conventional fantasy world through the eyes of a slightly unconventional protagonist sounds interesting, you know, I'd check it out. I'm not in a massive scramble to read the sequels immediately, but I'm more than open to checking them out one day. The book hasn't received a film or TV adaptation, but I guess that it has received a video game adaptation, which is a topic I find interesting, direct book-to-game adaptations. But that said, I haven't played it and have no immediate intention to. Couldn't have I wanted to anyway now that I live in the realm of magic and fantasy. No PlayStation here. And on that note, I think it may be time for me to finally get out of here, see if I can find my way back to the real world. Only problem is I don't know what I'm going to do with my bookshelf. Looks like a little magic may be called for, but maybe first I'll take a break to slay some orcs. The first 20 are for you. Good.